Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome ASCB President-Elect Don Cleveland. Thank you very much for that. I'm quite confident that you didn't come to watch me up here. But uh, so it's my great pleasure as uh, the f my first act as, uh, as the president-elect to, uh, to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, the, the 2012 E.B. Wilson Award winner. I, uh, if, and if I can have my, my, my first slide on the, oh, it's on the, they're on the side, yes. Yeah. So uh, uh, this is, uh, for the junior folks, uh, this is the ASCB's highest honor. For the senior folks, you all know that. And I've added just a little bit of background just to remind you about uh, E.B. Wilson and the award. You, of course, I, I'm going to detail some aspects of uh, Susan Lindquist's uh, career for you in just, in just a moment. Of course, she's going to sh show you actual science. She's, uh, many, all of you will know that she's now at uh, MIT and the Whitehead Institute and an investigator in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, which she's been for many years. Now, for uh, Edmund Beecher Wilson uh, was what many of us think was the first cell biologist. He certainly was one of the first and, one of the mo and, the, and the most prominent. He did pioneering work, absolutely pioneering work, uh, both on cell lineage and on sex determination. And he authored uh, what is arguably the most influential book in, in uh, in cell biology, and one of the most influential uh, books in uh, modern biology, The Cell in Inheritance and Development, which was then uh, updated uh, three times dur during his lifetime. Now, the, the list of winners, former winners, of this, uh, of this award is an august list starting uh, at, the, at the bottom left there, starting with uh, the initial winner, uh, winners of Dan Mazia, George Pilati, and Keith Porter. And if you step through the years through 2011, you'll count eight, at least eight Nobel laureates that, uh, pre uh, who, who, were, who were recipients, uh, some before, some after receiving the award. And t tonight, we're adding a final name, Susan Lindquist. Now, why are we adding Susan's name? All right, so she began her career uh, really look, looking at the heat shock response and de demonstrated it to be a homeostatic mechanism which protects cells from protein folding problems that arise with heat and then with a variety of other stresses. And that seemed to be an important cell process at the time, but as you'll see, she's taken it far beyond that. And she transitioned the, the, the effort into really understanding protein homeostasis more broadly and the wide range of biological processes that that process governs. Okay, so what did she really do? Well, first of all, she was a disappointment. Sure, her parents expected her to become a housewife and she, uh, she has lamentably failed them and actually failed them quite miserably. But in, instead, what she did was, she's uh, for the work that, she, that, that I'm going to very briefly highlight and that she'll uh, add in detail. She's been elected to the National Academy of Sciences and it, its uh, affiliated Institute of Medicine. She's won a series of previous prizes, perhaps not quite as prestigious as this one, at least in this society. And, and uh, oh, there is one that uh, arguably, uh, is not arguably the, the, the nation's highest honor in science, which she received from President Obama, the National Medal of Science. And additionally, she is one of the co-founders of a successful startup company, Foldex, now, now uh, wholly owned by Pfizer, in, in trying to develop therapies aimed at uh, Protein, protein misfolding diseases, one of which has uh, clearly, clearly been successful, and, and, and a, a fatal amyloid disease uh, of misfolding of transthyretin. Oh, and she didn't really fail her parents completely. So for those of you who do know her, she, uh, 
she is a role model in every regard for uh, young scientists uh, in that she's, a, she's been a devoted uh, spouse and mother f throughout that period. Now, what, what, had, what did she really do? And I suspect most of you will have uh, been, most of you without the gray hair, will have uh, recognized her contributions in understanding prions. And indeed, it was, uh, sh she brought to the fore the idea of using uh, uh, a following prion inheritance in yeast. And, but she took it much farther than that, demonstrating that you could use this as a mechanism uh, for genetic variation and phenotypic diversity. And indeed, she demonstrated where and how you can self-perpetuate a prion-like conformation in the cytosol, and even perhaps more importantly, uh, identifying the components, the, the factors that govern nucleation and a previously mysterious strain specificity of prions. And how, that is, and how all of those establish species, species barriers to uh, prion propagation. And indeed, it was her team that built the first uh, um, uh, mouse model of a spontaneous prion-like disease. And then even, and it just continues. And just this year, arguing that uh, prions and their uh, propagation in yeast are a common mechanism for phenotypic uh, inheritance. All right, but there, like the, like the late night TV guys, there's more. And indeed it was, the, it was Susan pictured here with HSP90 and evolution behind her who really uh, opened the door on what, H, what the, the family of heat shock proteins, especially the one family member, HSP90, can really do in facilitating phenotypic variation, arguing that it can affect rapid evolution. And that that's true, that's, tr that's true in fungi, that's true in plants, and that indeed it can, it, HSP90 and environmental stress can transform the adaptive value of natural genetic variation. Okay, you didn't come to hear me. What one last, one last personal anecdote, and it is when I first encountered uh, Susan Lindquist, and that encounter, as you're going to see, is something uh, that would would have told every last one of you that this was a very special person. So, and for the young people, she wrote the first renewal application of her first NIH grant and received uh, bad news. So she received a score that was clearly outside the funding range, despite uh, remarkable success during that first period. So she had to resubmit. So it, she agreed, and in that resubmission, she agreed with the referees. They were the referees from the genetics study section. Uh, which criticized her for not proposing to do much genetics in the future. And she wrote that she, that she believed that she had uh, initially proposed the right next experiments, uh, but they didn't include a great deal of genetics. And therefore, in revising her first resubmission, in revising that application, that she had changed not one word. She wrote that on the rebuttal, that front page rebuttal. And what happened? And what happened? So the review panel, the review panel was the, molecular, the old molecular biology study section. And look at the members of that panel. Maniatis, Richard Axel, Shirley Tillman, Hal Weintraub, Ron Evans, oh, oh, and me. So, uh, so most of the panel was really the top tier of science, and that panel score, and that, that application, which had been changed not by one word, scored as the highest ranked application from the molecular biology panel for that year in three rounds of review. And that was my introduction to that, that I had to pay attention to Susan Lindquist. And on that note, I'd like to invite her up here to, to give the 2012 E.B. Wilson uh, lecture. And to Thank you so much.
thank you so much. Um, I have to say I'm uh, truly deeply honored uh, by this. I, I remember coming to my very first uh, ASCB meeting, and I couldn't have even in my wildest dreams imagined that, uh, that I would be getting this award one day. Um, and in terms of that last anecdote, I, I don't normally think of myself as a brave person. I really sweated blood and tears about re <laughs> submitting that application, but damn it, it was the right experiments. <laughs> and uh, and I, I would have to say that I've, I've sweated a lot of blood and tears over the course of my career about trying to do things that uh, sometimes a lot of people didn't think I made any sense, but um, uh, it has worked out for me. So I uh, thank very much um, the amazing Society of Cell Biology for the extraordinary work they've done over the years and for this extraordinary honor for me today. I really appreciate it. So I'm going to start out with this quote, which I'm sure all of you have seen many times. I don't need to read it. Um, we live and breathe this all the time, right? This, this is life. But in considering the inheritance of environmentally acquired traits, Dobzhansky, this giant in evolutionary biology and genetics, also said, this question has been discussed almost ad nauseum in the old biological literature so that we may refrain from the discussion of it altogether. Uh, and so what I'd like to say is, um, I think he's wrong. <laughs> so we think, in fact, that there are multiple plausible mechanisms for the inheritance of environmentally acquired traits. I'm going to tell you about just one of those mechanisms tonight. I'm going to tell you about HSP90. And uh, as I'm very glad that Don um, mentioned that we've also been working on prions because prions provide just as bit, every bit as spectacular a mechanism by which organisms can inherit in a single step very complicated new traits. And I w decided it would be just a bit too much to present both of those uh, to you tonight. So I'm just going to be telling you uh, about HSP90. What I would like to say, however, is that if HSP90 provides a plausible mechanism and prions provide a plausible mechanism and my lab happens to have stumbled into both of these, it can't be that they're the only mechanisms out there. There have got to be multiple, multiple mechanisms for this. So it all really has its root in protein folding. And the, the um, basic problem in protein folding is that proteins start out as these very long strings of amino acids and they have to fold into these very exquisitely specific shapes. And unless they fold into exactly those shapes, they just don't function. Or, or even worse, as in uh, that disease that uh, Don was mentioning that we worked on, and we've been working on a lot of other protein folding diseases, uh, they can, those misfolded states can go awry and do terrible damage. And I talked about some of that in an earlier symposium. But the, the real heart of the problem is that proteins have to acquire these folds in an absolutely absurd environment. They have to do that inside of a living cell where the concentration of other proteins is about 300 milligrams per mil, as, as illustrated in this beautiful uh, picture by David Goodsell. But what this picture does not convey, does not begin to convey, is the kinetic energy of the system because proteins are moving around like crazy inside the cell. The average soluble protein is moving at uh, the rate of about five meters per second. Of course, they don't get very far uh, in a second because they're crashing into other proteins constantly and the number of collisions, there, there are millions of collisions per second. So that's the only way in which biology can work. All biological systems are poised on this, this uh, energy cliff with a tremendous amount of kinetic energy in the system that allows proteins to find each other in this very, very crowded environment, proteins to get from one end of the cell to another, a signal to be transduced from one end of the cell to another in a very short period of time. But it, it creates a, a real crisis in the cell in terms of protein folding. And it means that really virtually all organisms are on, on a precipice, very near a precipice, of a protein folding crisis. And so when you think about proteins going about their business inside of a living cell, 
It's, it's very important to remember the next two movies. It's not like Esther Williams and her mermaids. It's not a synchronized swim. <laughs> it's really much more like uh, the Summerland Amusement Park in Tokyo on a really hot summer day. That is really a much more realistic picture of what it's like inside of a living cell. So um, you can just imagine then if there was a little bit more kinetic energy put into that system, a little bit of a heat shock, for example, or if um, a little bit of the water was withdrawn from that system with osmotic stress, or if certain particular individuals in that pool were not really quite physically fit, were not folded properly, what disaster could happen in a hurry. And that's what is happening in biological systems all the time, and that shapes the behavior of biological systems in incalculable ways, including the ways in which in, uh, biological systems evolve. So uh, the way we've got into this was by studying something called, as Don mentioned, the heat shock response, which really is a response not just to heat, but all kinds of different stresses that, that, and I was originally studying it purely because I was interested in what turns genes on and off. But after a while, we got pretty curious about, well, what the heck are these proteins doing? And you can see that these are all named HSPs by various numbers according to their sizes. And these are just different proteins that are turned on by all kinds of stresses, and they help cells cope with all sorts of different stresses. And um, they're induced by, as I mentioned, osmotic stress, heat, to pH, uh, all sorts of different things that, that uh, we now know um, uh, cause proteins to have trouble folding. But the fact that they're induced actually winds up providing tremendous amounts of protection against these stresses uh, because these stresses all cause proteins to unfold. And organisms are um, always facing changes in their environment. This is, of course, you can imagine true of most of the organisms out there in the environment, like many of the microorganisms I'll talk about. But it's also true of us because our internal protein folding landscape is shaped and altered by all sorts of things, like simple changes in the energetics, because protein folding requires a lot of energy. So these mechanisms, this, this problem in protein folding is as old as life itself. And the mechanisms that protect and provide, allow cells to live so close to this protein folding cliff are also very, very highly conserved. So we move around between lots of different organisms when we look at this. And it involves the induction of all kinds of things that are called, for example, protein chaperones. And protein chaperones very, very uh, simply, are the, the, their functions are, are very much encapsulated in their names. Uh, what they do is they bind to immature protein species, prevent them from making inappropriate liaisons when they crash into other proteins, when they get introduced to other proteins. And then they, they let go of those proteins and let them go about their business when they mature. There are also disaggregases that take protein aggregates apart, and there are um, all sorts of proteases, and there are uh, other mechanisms too, like this, the production of osmolites, like trilose. And all of those are very, very highly conserved. But I'm going to tell you today about just one of them. I'm going to tell you about HSP90 and how it, we've discovered that it, it seems to play a big role, not just in providing protection against stress, but in actually helping organisms to evolve new states. And so the basic features are about HSP90 are that we found out genetically when we first decided to attack this problem in yeast is, first of all, that it's, it's an essential protein. That's good. It, it, it really is necessary for life. But the other thing is that it's, it's expressed at a much higher level than you'd normally need it. And that's actually different than all of the other heat shock proteins we know. Almost all of the other heat shock proteins are made just really very tightly at, at just the level you need them. They don't, you don't make much extra. But HSP90 is normally made at about tenfold higher concentration than cells normally need. And that means that it serves as a sort of standing protein folding buffer. It can help cells, even in the absence of additional induction, cope with a lot of protein folding stress. 
but it's not a generalist, unlike HSP-70 or GROW-EL or some of the other uh, chaperones you might have heard of. HSP-90 really only folds a specialized set of proteins, and um, it, the nature of those proteins is particularly interesting with respect to thinking about the evolution of new traits, because the proteins that HSP-90 folds are metastable proteins that are major regulators of development. Now that's a little bit of an over uh, simplification, but it, it, it will do for the purposes of this talk. HSP-90 specializes in helping, we now know, in helping proteins that are, that are sort of poised and uh, metastable. They need to make changes in conformation, big changes in conformation, in order to serve as signal transducers and to, to change the biological processes in response to other signals. But that means that they are poised in very difficult protein folding space in terms of the conformations that they, they assume. So that fact, together with the fact that HSP90 is, is abundant, it's, it's made it at a higher level than normal, it serves as a buffer, allows HSP90 to act as a potentiator and as a capacitor for genetic variation. So don't worry about too much about what those two words mean. I'll, I will explain that in a moment. And it is that quality, this quality of, of working on a very specialized, interesting, powerful class of proteins that have big impacts on the biological systems and the fact of serving, having being there in excess as a buffer that allows HSP90 to then uh, serve such an important role, we think, in the evolution of new traits. So, we started working on the genetics of HSP90 in yeast, and as I mentioned, we found that it was essential, but that it was present in much higher concentrations. You needed all of that excess protein for the cells to grow at high temperatures. They really needed it for stress. But at normal temperatures, they didn't need very much. And then, well, that didn't tell us really very much about what it was doing. And then uh, several other labs sort of simultaneously ran into HSP90, really by, by sheer accident when they were studying other processes. So a group of people who were studying steroid hormone receptors ran into, each, ran into HSP90 when they were looking at the inactive receptor. And HSP90 was quite tightly bound to these various steroid receptors like corticoid receptor and estrogen receptor and androgen receptor. But it was bound to the inactive form. And then uh, another group of people ran into HSP90 uh, accidentally um, as being complexed with inactive oncogenic kinases, kinases were, that were just recently made and were not yet activated. And so very naturally, the suggestion was made that HSP90 is acting as a repressor of those proteins. It's binding to them and keeping them inactive. And we had just created these strains in yeast that had high levels of HSP90, and low levels of HSP90 and were just fine as long as you kept them at, at normal temperatures. And so we, we had a perfect system for asking whether or not that was true. We just put those, uh, those types of mammalian proteins, the system is very, very highly conserved, we put those proteins into our yeast strains that differ, were absolutely isogenic, differed only in having different amounts of this protein folding buffer. So of course, if HSP90 was serving as a repressor, when you reduce the HSP90 buffer, those proteins should become super active. So let me just show you the results with one of those proteins, and that was the protein VSARC, which was actually the very first oncogenic kinase ever, ever uh, identified. And when we expressed VSARC in strains that had either normal levels of HSP90 or very low levels of HSP90, transcription was pretty much the same, translation was pretty much the same, pretty much for quite similar levels of VSARC were made.